If you have your Bibles, we'd ask you to turn to 1 Kings chapter 20. 1 Kings chapter 20. Uh, while you're turning there, I remind you to remember your missionaries when you are praying at home and uh, their continued blessing. And I wish we had more missionaries. Uh, they're getting more and more difficult to find. Uh, 1 Kings chapter 20, and we're going to begin reading in verse 20. Uh, 1 Kings 20, beginning in verse 20, the Bible says, And they slew every one his man, and the Syrians fled. And Israel pursued after them, and Benadad, the king of Syria, escaped on a horse with, with the horsemen. And the king of Israel went out and smote the horses and chariots and slew the Syrians with a great slaughter. And the prophet came to the king of Israel and said unto him, Go, strengthen thyself, and mark, and, set, and see what thou doest. For at the return of the year, the king of Syria will come up against thee. And the servants of the king of Syria said unto him, their gods are gods of the hills. Therefore, they are stronger than we. But let us fight against them in the plain, and surely we shall be stronger than they. And do this thing, take the kings away, every man out of his place, and put captains in their rooms. And, and number thee an army, like the army that thou hast lost, horse for horse, and chariot for a chariot, and we will fight against them in the plain, and surely we shall be stronger than they. And he hearkened unto their voice and did so. And it came to pass at the return of the year that Benadad numbered the Syrians and went up and went up to Aphek to fight against Israel. And the children of Israel were numbered, and were all present, and went, and went against them. And the children of Israel pitched before them like two little flocks of kids. But Syria filled the country. And there came a man of God, and spake unto the king of Israel, and said, Thus saith the Lord, because the Syrians have said, The Lord is God of the hills, but is not God of the valleys. Therefore will I deliver all this great multitude unto thine hand, and ye shall know that I am the Lord. Dear Lord, we thank you for your precious word. Lord, we thank you for each and every one that's come out this morning. Lord, we know uh, that they're here by divine appointment, and that they hear the word of God in mercy and truth. God, we pray for the lost that meet among us, Lord, that you would give them attentive ear and that you would open their heart and that you would save them. For those of us that are redeemed and saved, Lord, that you might write on our hearts the scriptures in this book. And we'd be faithful to give you the praise for it, for it's in Christ's name we do pray. Amen. Amen. Now we'll be preaching this morning on the God of the valley. Now, in the modern day, and as you see in the Old Testament teaching too, the lost have no understanding of God, nor would should we anticipate them to. That he had the, they, the, uh, the Assyrians, the enemy of God, had him defined as a God of the hilltop, the God of the mountaintop, the God of the high place, but not the God of the valley. Now, uh, I want you to remember and know that our God is God of, of the valley too. He will help you. He will grant you a victory in the valley just as much as he will on the mountaintop. And that's the business that he's in. Even in the valley, our God is good. Now, does that make the valley uh, palatable? Does it make it... Does it make something that you would enjoy? No, but God is in there. Now, most of the time, we don't see him because we think the valley is a place of hardship and difficulty, but it's not always the case. Now, these verses, as the king of Syria come against God's people, 
are very common throughout the whole Old Testament. Uh, time and time again, and even today, as we see in recent history in Israel, there are going to be enemies of God come against God's people. Now, in the modern day, the God's people is the Lord's churches, and people come against them every day. We're classified as bigots. We're classified as holier than thou. Uh, because we won't join in into modern Christianity, we're looked at as outcasts. Uh, don't think that as a novel new thing. It's been the history of God's people. And, and, and so we find then, in the very same way, uh, we find a little excerpt of God's people in the history where they're suffering such a thing. In verse 20, the Bible says, And they, meaning Israel, slew every one his man. Now, I think that's very, uh, very interesting that they took an ownership of one individual, his man. I'm going to defeat, I'm going to kill this individual on behalf of God. Now, uh, first of all, that's very, fairly uh, serious language. Uh, but remember, the Assyrians attacked them, not the other way around. And very much like the battle we presently see in Israel, Israel was not the instigator. And, and so we see that in similar sense they were attacked here and they took on personal ownership of the problem. You know a lot of what's wrong with the churches today? No one wants to take on personal ownership of the problems and, and of the difficulties that uh, arise. But these men stood up to the mount, took that step and said, well, this one's mine. Verse 21 and the king of Israel went out and smote the horses and chariots and slew the Syrians with a great slaughter. Now, I want you to see that their leader took on responsibility as well. Uh, I would not be a good pastor and a good example to you if I didn't take on the responsibility myself. It's just as much, in fact, he took more. He picked out their leaders and he took them out as well. In the battle, everybody has a responsibility. And uh, we need to remember that in the last day. Uh, this is not a one-man show. And, and so we see in the very same way, uh, the leader, the king, he stepped up to the pilot and said, this one I will do. Verse 22, And the prophet came to the king of Israel and said unto him, Go strengthen thyself and mark. Now, another key, a key excerpt in this set of scriptures, he was specifically told to strengthen himself. Now, we live, and uh, fortunately, I never, uh, unfortunately, I never got involved in it, but we live in a day of exercise. Now, this is what I found about uh, uh, exercise, if you do your job, mostly you get all the exercise you need. But you have bodybuilders and people who run and people who swim. And it seems like that's been a celebratory thing in our culture for years. But what I want you to see, he said, exercise yourself. Uh, you're responsible. If you're in a bad spiritual condition this morning, do you know whose fault it is? It's yours. If you're not getting what you need from the pulpit, study yourself. If you're not, and, and exercise indicates action, that you're doing something, something, something beyond private study, that you're getting out there and maybe knocking a few doors, or if you can't do that in the modern age, that you're emailing somebody, or you're placing some scripture on Facebook, or something on behalf of Christ. You, what happens when you don't use a muscle? You lose it, right? And so we are to be doing these things, and the king specifically, the prophet held him responsible. And the prophet came to the king of Israel and said unto him, Go strengthen thyself, and mark and see what thou doest, 
For at the return of the year, the king of Syria will come up against thee. Now, the king of Israel gets a, a warning that most people don't get. He's going to be back. Now, I'm going to give you a warning that only the church gets. He's going to be back. If the devil is leaving you alone at the moment, dear friend, he's going to be back. He's going to be there with discouragement. He's going to be there with heartache. He's going to be there with difficulty. And dear friend, that's your battle. What, what, what did the Bible say concerning uh, the, uh, on the mountain when the Lord was uh, tempted by the devil? At the end of it, what does it say in the Gospel of Matthew? And he left him for a season. So you know what that tells me? That he come back again. I don't think the devil was done with the Lord Jesus Christ on that one small occasion, do you? Uh, I mean, he was up against God's own son. And you know what? Instead of seeing, seeing him as the victor, you know how the devil saw that? He saw it as an opportunity. And, and, and no doubt he did come back, and he'll come back for you. And when he comes back for you, dear friend, you will find yourself in the valley. Uh, verse 23, And the servants of the king of Syria said unto him, Their gods are gods of the hills. Now, uh, I want you to see, again, lost people don't understand God. Uh, and, 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 you know, that's, and, you know, one thing about be believing in election and God's all sovereign power, you're not beating your head against that wall trying to get someone saved, <laughs> trying to talk them into something. And you know why? Because our God is not like unto their gods. And and the lost people of Syria thought they understood the character of God. Now, I want you to notice two things. First of all, in your King James Bible, that would have a little g gods, meaning they didn't recognize him as God. And if they don't recognize him as God, you know what? They don't understand him as God. And uh, also, I want you to see they didn't understand his character because they said, well, he's a God of the hills and not the God of the valley. Uh, you know, lost people will come to you and you have, you know, you have some difficult times in your life and, <laughs> and you serve God. They're jesting with you. Didn't, didn't they not do that to the Lord Jesus Christ? Hail, King of the Jews. You know what? Jesus was in, was in the valley, in a deep valley, yeah. was he not? Yeah. And, and, and those people came to him, and they'll do the very same thing to you if you have a hardship in your life, death of loved ones, loss of home, or whatever it may be. Don't, don't anticipate encouragement from the world. And, and so these individuals thought they understood the nature of the God of the Bible, and yet and still... Uh, didn't understand him at all. One of the chief characteristics of the God we serve is omnipresent. That means he's ever-present, always, everywhere, at all times. What a glorious God. So if you're headed toward the valley, listen, dear friend, you have a friend that's already beat you to it. That is the God of the Bible. And he is always there. And so... Again, lost people not understanding the nature of God, uh, this lost Syrian leader had a plan and said, I think I understand what's going on. Verse 24, and do this thing, take the kings away, every man out of his place, and put captains in their rooms, and number thee in army, like the army that thou hast lost, horse for her, horse, chariot for chariot, and we will fight against them in the plain or the valley, and surely we shall be stronger than they. And he hearkened unto their voice and did so. Now, I want you to notice another thing about the valley. Not only is your God there, 
the enemy is there as well. <clears throat> he is present. He's doing his thing. And he's always going to be in opposition. He's always going to be a difficulty and a hardship to you. So this is huge Syrian army was coming down to meet God's people in the valley, but God was going to be with them. He's going to be present. He's going to be their defender. He was going to be the person uh, that, that would be to their aid. Now, this morning, I have no idea where you're at. You may be on the very tippy top of the highest mountain and looking out and seeing the goodness of God, or you may be in the lowest valley that you have ever been. I don't know, but I know that my God knows, and wherever you're at, if you're up here or down here or somewhere in between, God's with you. He's present. Now, as discouraging as this may sound, Probably Satan's with you too, Amen. or at least one of his imps. Now remember this about Lucifer or Satan. He is not omnipresent. He is not everywhere at the same time. Now he's got a band of imps that we have no idea the number, that he can say, you go do this and you go do that. But remember, <laughs> who, you know, who did he always worry? Where is documentation? We know two men that he went against for sure, right? Job, right? And Jesus. He just—he don't waste his time on ordinary people, does he? Remember the Mary Magdalene? What does it say about her? Of whom was seven devils cast out? Now, he didn't, he didn't waste himself on Mary Magdalene, did he? He, he let some of his imps go do his work. Right. Apparently, Mary wasn't that high class. Mm -hmm. and, and, and so we see then uh, that wherever this battle may be, both beings are going to be there in some sense. Both, both of the evil and the good is going to be present. Verse 26, and it came to pass on the return of the year, a year later, and Benadad numbered the, Syri the Syrians and went up to a Apec to fight against Israel. And the children of Israel were numbered and were all present. Now, I want you to see it's just like in the present day battle that we see in the Middle East right now, that it says they were numbered and they were all present. Now, Israel, in, in two days, amassed 120,000 soldiers to their little tiny army. All they had to do was call, and they were there. Wouldn't that be a wonderful thing this morning if all that the Lord Jesus Christ had to do is call, and, and, and we would say, present, I'm here. What would you have me to do? Where, where would you have me to go? At one little snap of the fingers. That, that's the people of Israel. They've always been that way. And you know why? Because they love their nation. And you know why? We're not always necessarily ready. We don't love Christ nearly like we should. Right. Occasionally, when we remember the great sacrifice that he gave on our behalf, we'll love him for a little while. And then we get back to the world. You know, when we think about the world, we think that we have to be swept away with pornography or adultery or something like that. You don't have, it don't have to be something like that to sweep you away. Uh, ladies, you be swept away by cooking. Now, I like to eat, but you know what? The Lord is more important. Gentlemen, you can be swept away by your job. I know because it's happened to me. When uh, someone tells you what a great nurse you are enough, you start to believe it, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. You get swept away in that. And, and, and so we find 
that these were actually somewhat the option. And as soon as they were called, they were all there and they were all ready again to do whatever part that they needed. And the children of Israel were numbered and were all present and went against and went against them. And the children of Israel pitched before them like two little flocks of kids, but the Syrians filled the country. Now, I want you to get the the opposition, and I want to I want you to get the picture of the battle that that the the Israelites, it's just like they were two little kids, uh, uh, and kids meeting like lambs, but meeting like the young from sheep, uh, immature, scrawny, young. And so there was just two little groups of them. See, in the valley, you're going to feel outnumbered. In 2023, do y'all not feel outnumbered? Or am I by myself in the valley? You look about and just shake your head and say, where am I? Is this the America I grew up in? I'm old enough. I remember when all the stores was closed on the Lord's Day. If you wanted a bottle of Coke on Sunday, you better get it Saturday night or you wouldn't go get it, gonna get it. You, have, you better check your gas tank to have enough to ride to church because you know what? If not, you're walking. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And look at us now. And, and you just turn and you, you have to shake your head. Uh, Christian people, if you're not individually or personally in the valley this morning at least the Lord's churches I mean we, we live in the deepest valley of the largest sin pit really on the face of this earth and here we are in it so I don't think the question is is if what are you going to do in the valley are you going to are you going to make the very best of it are you going to be glad? Are you going to be happy? Are you going to serve him? Now, in some parts of Stewart County, and I didn't know about it, I heard about it, but I didn't know really what it was until uh, much later. But some of the flattest land that we have in Stewart County is called Red Top. And if you go east toward Clarksville, about where just a little past where Adam and Sarah live and the land starts rising all that ridge up there all the way down toward Indian Mound on the high side is what's called Red Top. It's the flattest land in Stewart County. But most of it's just like this. And you know what? People are glad to have the valley. Y'all all seen our place. We have those five acres on the creek. The other 11 is just like this, right? That's, that's typical Stewart County stuff. So we make the most of the valley. We have our bees down there. We used to have Matthew's horse down there. We have our chickens down there. We have our garden down there. We make the very best of it. What about you? In your valley, do you ever recognize, well, God's placed me here? There has to be a reason. When you're, when you're in the valley, do you look around and take inventory? You know, if your, your family was going to, about to go hungry, surely you would look in the cupboard and number your supplies, right? Why don't we do that spiritually? Okay, I've studied the Bible this much. I'm praying this much. I'm looking toward the east. <laughs> Are you spiritually prepared for the valley? And I dare say the majority of us are not. So when we find ourselves in the valley, you know what, sometimes the valley is very sudden. Now, back home in Carlisle, because it's all on the creek down there, there are grapevines literally everywhere. And we'd cut those dudes off the ground and they were instant swing. And the only problem is sometimes you got out there and there's this huge ditch. And uh, you could swing, if it was really good, you could swing across it and then land on the other side. 
and you were past cool, right? And uh, so we did that a lot, and I was good at it because I was very thin then. And uh, uh, my friend, Greg, he wasn't quite as thin as me, to say the least. And uh, so he, he was going to show me up, and he grabbed it to get out in the middle, and then old Greg got started going, shh, shh, shh. Y'all know how they do right before they pop. And then, man, he was in the valley. He was walling in there and hollering and crying. And I, 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 I couldn't help him because I was laughing so much. Uh, but he got in the valley quick, didn't he? We, we anticipated that we're going to know it, that it's going to be gradual. Not always that way. Sometimes... Boom, you're there. Have you ever woke up and just felt like there was a melancholy calling all over you? Like you were sad from the point you opened your eyes? Seemingly for no reason. You know what that is? You woke up in the valley. You woke up there. You don't even know how you got here, but here I am. I'm back in the valley. And, and, and very frequently, that's what we find ourselves and if you're unprepared, you certainly ain't going to be ready for it then. Verse 28. And there came a man of God and spake unto the king of Israel. Now remember, uh, he had done this a year earlier. And there came a man of God and spake unto the king of Israel and said, Thus saith the Lord, besides the Syrians have said, because the Assyrians have said, the Lord is a God of hills, but is not a God of the valleys. Therefore will I deliver all this great multitude unto thine hand, and ye shall know that I am the Lord. Now I want you to notice two things. First of all, that uh, he he reminded them of the message and said hey God's with you even in this place and I'm doing it why for my own glory see that's the problem of Armenian doctrine they think you're saved to get out of hell <laughs> or to avoid hell you know why the Lord saved you to bring glory to himself right that, that's the only reason he did it, because listen, you're not anything worthwhile, right? That, that's the hardest thing for a human being to ever admit, is that we have no real intrinsic value. Because we're taught that we are, right? More valuable than gold. And, and when we learn, hey, there's really just nothing good about me at all, it, it is very, very humbling. And you know what? Most people run from it. But when we, when we find that God saved us for his own glory, man, what a wonderful thing. And so he reminds them of this, and he says, I'm going to deliver because of my goodness. Verse 29, and they pitched over, and they pitched one over against the other seven days. And, and so it was that in the seventh day, the battle was joined and the children of Israel slew of the Syrians a hundred thousand footmen in one day, and the rest fled to Aphek into the city, and there a wall fell upon twenty-seven thousand of the men that were left, and Benadad fled and came into the city into an inner chamber. Now, uh, that's all I'm going to leave it. I want you to see that the enemy, thinking that they had escaped, but when they got home, their own wall fell on them. Is there anything outside the ability of our God? The, the best I can understand of those that went to battle, Aphek was the only one that came out. See, that's the God of the Bible. That, that's the God we serve. He can turn the valley into victory. He can take that place of hopelessness, hopelessness and make it to the glory of himself. So don't be discouraged in the valley. Don't be upset that you've arrived here again. Look for the way that the Lord will be magnified. Now I want to read one more quick verse of set of scriptures that we're going to be done. Go with me to Isaiah. Isaiah 22. And we're going to begin reading in verse first verse. Isaiah 22 in the first verse. The burden 
of the valley of vision. Now, you know what? Sight is a glorious thing, is it not? Have you ever met someone that truly is totally blind? I've met a few. And literally, their, their outward eye is just gray. There, there's nothing there. There's not even a pupil. You see what I'm saying? And what we do in nursing, when we give them a plate, we have to say, your carrots are at 3, at, at three o'clock, your beans are at 6 o'clock, your bread is at 9 o'clock, and your meat's at 12 o'clock. And that's how they know how they're played. You know what? That, that's a horrible thing when my hearing started getting bad. For a minute, I was upset. And then I thought, praise God, it's not my vision. Mm -hmm. there, there are things worse, right? So, now this is the problem. You got this great vision, and the Lord has blessed me exceedingly with vision. And you're looking down the end of the gun. <laughs> Watch your vision. Are you in the valley? I would say so, right? Vision can be good and bad, right? What are you seeing this morning? I think a lot of it's how we look at things, don't you? You can, uh, you can cry about it, or you can say, well, praise God. Man, I'm looking at Israel, and I'm excited. Hey, this could be it. They could go all the way to the Red Sea of God, Gaza and be back at the Temple Mount. Wouldn't that be an incredible, wonderful thing in my lifetime to see the Arabs out of the Temple Mount once and for all? Wouldn't it be uh, one of those glorious, one of those missiles guided by the mighty hand of God just totally take that off the Temple Mount? You know what? Our God is able. But I know people that would fret about it, don't you? You see, it depends on how you look at it. So we find Isaiah in the Valley of Vision, and I think it's very, uh, a very uh, unique statement to say in the Valley of Vision. The valley, the hard place, the difficult place with vision, which perhaps is the greatest blessing we know to be able to see the beauty that God placed us in, in the valley of vision. What aileth thee now that thou art wholly gone up to the housetops? And that was because they go up there to pray. Thou that art full of stirs, a tumultuous city, a joyous, a joyous city, that slain men are not slain with the sword, nor dead in battle. All the rulers are fled together. They are bound by the archer, archers. All that are found in thee are bound together, which have fled from thee. Horrible, horrible situation. Therefore, said I, Look away from me. I will weep bitterly. Labor not to comfort me because of the spoiling of the daughter of my people. You know what? Uh, Isaiah at this point wasn't running in victory, was he? He said, don't look at me. I've got to cry over this. The valley was real. You know what? Sometimes your valley is going to be more than real. You're going to get some bad news. What if, what, what if right now, and, and, and it's such a realistic thing, and, and Don and I have talked a lot about this. What if there's no more money? What are you going to do? When, when I first took this job that I'm in now, and I, I mean, it was such a weird question, I answered it before I thought. This shows how men's minds get strained. Do you want an automatic deposit or do you want a check? Uh, I, I, I'd almost forgotten what a check was. And before I even thought about it, I said, just put it in automatic deposit. But I'd probably been better to take a check, you know what I'm saying? One click of the mouse and you're broke. Ever thought about that? It, it's a reality. That, that would be some lamentable stuff. If you look in, in your bank accounts, 
and you just see a line of zeros. How you gonna buy food? How you gonna pay, my mother used to say, how you gonna pay for the current? Pretty sad, ain't it? That, that, that's a real thing. Uh, look at your vision. Now again, the, the question is, it's not the situation, because we know the situation. It's what are you gonna see in it? What, what are you gonna behold? Oh, woe is me. Or are you going to behold, hey, things are getting a little closer. I see, I see some earmarks. We may be fixing to go up. What, what, what are we going to see? And I, I think that's, that's hugely important as we, as we walk through the last days is, okay, what am I seeing this? Verse 5, for it is a day of trouble and of treading down and of perplexity by the Lord God of hosts in the valley of vision, breaking down the walls and of the crying mountains. Now, notice this is the valley of vision at the end of verse 5, for it is a day of trouble. So one thing that we can see in the day of vision is trouble. Now, uh, so we see that it's not a question of trouble. It's how you look at the trouble. Right? It's how you're going to perceive this. And where does it fit in to other things? This is, this, is the, this is the area, this is the time of trouble. Where is it going to be placed in your vision? That is the question. End of treading down. What, what is treading down? Now we know that in, 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 the, in the history of Israel, treading down often has to do with harvest and they do like this to knock the wheat uh, the tares off the wheat or the, the seeds off the wheat but a treading down always indicates this too destruction to something or someone we're in a day of treading down so again the question is not what it's how you're going to see it do you, do you see the rich kernels of wheat falling off? It's going to be flour and wheat to make your biscuits? Or do you say, oh, woe is me. They're treading off. Well, sure they're going to tread off. That's their job. Hey, it's going to happen. Absolutely. So, but, but what I see, uh, even in this uh, recent stir-up of Israel, I, I, I see, hey, if they're treading down, it must harvest time. It must be at the end of the place. End of perplexity. Now that's when you don't understand much. You ever been perplexed? I mean truly, truly perplexed. Now, Donna often tells me this, and I think it left a mark on her. She talks about it a lot. <laughs> when her daddy and her mama took her to Mammoth Cave and they turned the lights out. And it was a darkness that could be felt. Literally miles under the ground. And nothing there but darkness. You ever feel like that's the day we live in? I do. I often pray for Sister Hannah. You're seeing a dark spot there. I, I respect you for sticking it out because she, she's seeing the next generation. Is that not scary when you hear some of her stories? These are people that are going to be in office one day? Is that not frighten you? As a very old man in that day, it frightens me. <laughs> it's, a dark, it's a dark day, is it not? I look down in perplexity. Uh, where <laughs> multiple marriages is legal. When this gay marriage stuff started, I knew the next thing would be is those old order Mormons want more than one wife. And it happened. It happened about a week later. They sued for the marriage certificates. And this didn't get the media attention that the rest of it did, but you know what? They won. 
you can have more than one wife. Now, while you would want to know if you want more than one wife, I'm not sure, but you can have them if you want them. See what I'm saying? I live in perplexity. I just, I shake my head and say, you know, uh, I'm trying to think of how far, I think God said it to Israel, how far you have fallen. How far we have fallen as a country. Totally different. But you know, in that perplexity, which is the valley, by the way, God is still the richest, most glorious life there is. You know what he shows me there? Larry, it's about time. Don't get too discouraged. Uh, you know what? I believe it'll be a very much a hard time of valley when he says, what does he say? He doesn't say, come down. He says, come up here. <laughs> Come up. You had to be down, right? What a glorious time that's going to be. Home to be with the Lord. And again, I, I don't know where you're at this morning. Don't need to, really. But if you're in the valley, uh, look up. Lift up your head. Your redemption draws nigh.